Good morning, Calvary. And it's great to be able to preach God's Word with us again today. Four weeks ago, Pastor Tim revealed our new mission statement to all of us. And I wonder how many of us can remember it. And if you do, why don't you type it in our live chat right now and declare it over our church? That's right. Go ahead and comment our mission statement in our live chat right now. For some of us, this term, mission statement, can be really foreign and confusing. I mean, what is a mission statement and why do we need it? Well, to put it in simpler terms, our mission statement is our why. Why do we do what we do? Why do we exist? Why do we have church? And it really boils down to this. And come on, say it together with me if you know it making a godly impact wherever we are. Yes, that's right. If you stripped everything away, the lights, the sound, the videos, the programs and events, you come to this call. And the reason for our existence is really to make a godly impact wherever we are. You know, to put it in a different way, it's like, how little children like to ask why. Why this? Why that? My four-year-old daughter is like this right now. She's so curious and she's always asking why about everything. Why does it rain? Why does the sun keep on following us? Why are there stars? And well, you know, uh, more frequently nowadays, it's why do I have to go to school? And if we apply this to our lives and we keep on asking why, why do we have to work? Why do we serve? Or why do we love? I pray that your answer to this question in life will be the same as mine, which is, and come on, say it together with me again, to make a godly impact wherever we are. Amen. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, it accounts to us one of the most famous and favourite battles of all time. The battle between David and Goliath. A young boy with only a sling and a staff in his hands against the nine-foot-tall, battle-hardened giant who was equipped from head to toe with cutting-edge military weapons. All odds were against David. Yet, all of us know what happened next. In verse 48, it says this, As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Isn't that amazing? David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from its chef. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Wow! Isn't that just incredible? The impact of a little insignificant stone from a random brook in the hands of a young boy whose faith was fixed on God. You see, it took only a tiny stone in the right trajectory to defeat a giant. It just took the faith of a young boy to chase away an army. And so Calvary, it doesn't matter how small we think we are as long as we are in the hands of of our God. It doesn't matter how insignificant or how ill-equipped we think we are as long as our faith is fixed on the God who has conquered all. We can make an impact. And not just a small, unnoticeable impact. Not just a small dent which the enemy can just brush off. But I believe that the impact we make will always be bigger than the size of our church. Come on, if you believe that, then type it a big amen. Say it 
together with me again. Our impact will be bigger than the size of our church. And I really believe that it will be bigger than the size of our church. It will be bigger than the size of our bank account or the resources. And maybe you're asking right now, how? How can we make such an impact? How may our impact be bigger than who we think we are? Well, we have to get these three things right. We have to encounter God, exemplify Christ, and empower lives. Pastor Tim talked about encountering God, and he shared that consistent practice of spiritual disciplines are essential to God encounters in our lives. Then Pastor Liana shared about exemplifying Christ and how when we live by the Spirit, we exemplify Christ in our lives. And only after we have achieved these two steps can we truly accomplish the last step, which is to empower lives. And it's really important we get these first two steps right before we jump straight into the third. If not, the impact which we make wouldn't truly be godly and lasting. So once again, God has called us to make a godly impact wherever we are. And we do so by encountering God, exemplifying Christ, and empowering lives. Come church, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity that you have given me to share your word. I pray God that you anoint my lips of clay. You turn my message from one which is just of man's wisdom to your word, oh God, that you will pierce into the hearts and you will bear much fruit. God, Holy Spirit, fill our rooms wherever we are right now that you will do your work. Your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, turn with me to Matthew chapter 14, verse 12 to 22. Matthew chapter 14, verse 12 and 22. And this is the famous account of Jesus feeding the 5,000. You know, there are only two miracles which are recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. One of which is obviously the resurrection of Jesus, which is totally vital to our Christian faith, right? And the other is this. So, if you're taking notes, would you write down also these other three passages where I'll also be talking about this. They are Mark chapter 6, verse 30 to 45, Luke chapter 9, verse 10 to 17, and John chapter 6, verse 1 to 15. But now, reading from Matthew chapter 14, verse 12 to 22, it says this. When Jesus heard what happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Circle that. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish. They answered, Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and brought the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men beside women and children. 5,000 men besides women and children. The first thing I want to highlight from this passage is that Jesus wants to partner with us in the empowering process. God could have just sent manna or quail from heaven just as he did for the Israelites in the wilderness. Or he could have called the ravens to bring meat to the 5,000 just as he did for Elijah. 
Instead, he chose to ask the disciples to give them something to eat. And God does this because that is His mission. God wants to empower us to empower others. I say that again. God wants to empower us to empower others. And He chose to use His children to accomplish His will because that is what any good father would do. As a father, my desire for my daughters is to grow up to be independent women who will contribute back into society and build the lives of others around. Therefore, even though my elder daughter is young, we teach her to care for her younger sister. We empower her to feed her meme, even though we know that it will create more mess and it will be so much faster to feed my daughters directly. And I'm sure all the parents here will agree with me when I say that it's such a joy when we see our children serving each other. Likewise, our Heavenly Father is glad when He sees His children, us, empowering one another. So once again, Jesus wants to partner with us in the empowering process and He does so by empowering us first. Notice here in this passage, we can see a clear dissemination of God's empowerment. Jesus, He takes the bread from the boy and the disciples and then He gives thanks and breaks the bread. Then, He gives the pieces to the disciples who broke the bread further and distributed the bread to the crowd. Notice that the disciples were very much in the process of the miracle. In fact, I believe that the miracle happened in the hands of the disciples as they were distributing the food. You know, it was like, well, here you go, and here you go, and here you go, and oh, there's still more? Wow, okay, now here you go, and here, and here, and here, yeah, you too, you too, and everybody gets bread. It must have been totally amazing and mind-blowing for the disciples as they witnessed firsthand how just five loaves and two fish was multiplied to feed 5,000 men. 5,000 men, not including women and children. No wonder this miracle was accounted in all four Gospels. This experience must have been engraved in all of the disciples' hearts. And so, you know, church, this shows that if you want to make a godly impact where you are, or when you want to empower lives, all you need to do is obey God, and God will work it out. Just obey God, and God will work it out. Friends, there will never be a perfect time to perform a miracle. There will never be an optimum time to empower others. And if you are waiting for the right conditions to step out into God's calling, can I tell you that that time is now? It is, just like the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant into the Jordan River. They didn't wait until the waters were dried up so that they can walk. God just performed that miracle along the way and they stepped into the water in faith. Or like Peter. Peter, he didn't wait to step out of the boat, you know, uh, when the boat was on dry land or on shallow waters. All he needed was to hear Jesus' call and then he jumped out of the boat to walk on water. My friends, just step out of the boat and allow God of the miracles to do what he does best which is to do the impossible and you know even if you sink like how peter sank when he saw the wind and the waves we have the assurance that jesus will be there to pick us up he will never fail us amen so now that we know Jesus wants to partner with us in the empowering process and He does so by empowering us. The question really is, how may we empower others? How may we empower others? And right now, very quickly, I want to share with us 
three T's we can use to practically empower lives. Three T's. I mean, what's a sermon for me without a few alliterations, right? So, three T's, and they are time, trust, and truth. We empower lives with our time, with our trust, and with the truth. So, number one, we can empower lives by spending time to teach people. There's a famous saying, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. And that couldn't be truer. Yes, teaching takes so much more time than just doing it ourselves. And it will be so much easier to just, you know, do that task directly. But can I tell you that in the long run, it's all worth it. I remember teaching my daughter how to button her blouse and it took forever. <laughs> At times, it was frustrating. She would try and try with her little fingers and she would get frustrated and I would get frustrated and it would just turn messy. And it was so easy and so tempting, honestly, to take over and button her blouse myself, especially if we were running late. But what would that have meant for her? How would I, as a dad, be preparing her for independence? So all I can do is wait. Watch her and wait and be there to encourage her and then celebrate when she does it and she succeeds. Now, I'm so glad that Danielle has no problem buttoning her blouse and now the only next step is to teach her how to tie her own shoelaces. You know, Calvary, we have to be patient if we want to empower lives. I mean, if Jesus had to spend three years with the disciples day and night preparing them for ministry, then it shows us clearly that time is essential to empowerment. Now, the second essential is that we need to empower life with our trust. And trust me when I say that trust is important. Years ago, when I was developing as a youth leader, I remember leading a group of youth in a ministry. The youth were further broken up into smaller groups where one of them was the group leader who reported to me. The youth, they were thriving and the groups were so passionate so much so that one of the leaders of these groups decided to take more initiative and increase discipleship for his group. It sounds really awesome, right? But instead of encouraging this leader, I feared what he might do. And I didn't trust that he would be able to lead them properly. And so we disbanded this group. What potentially could have been the rise of a passionate group of youth was snuffed out by me only because of my distrust. And I'll be honest, I think really often about what could have been. As leaders, we need to stand alongside our team. And if we don't have the power to trust, we won't have the power at all. So trust me, church, when I say that trust is important. Finally, if we want to empower lives, we need to empower others with the truth. Yes, the truth, because the world which we live in is full of lies. The Bible says that Jesus has given us authority. He has empowered us. And the Bible says that we are the head and not the tail. We are more than conquerors. We are victorious. But the devil, he wants to us to abdicate this power. His methods are to discourage, to distract, to disconnect us from God. And now, more than ever, church, the world tells us to be someone we are not. And our younger generation is especially at risk. For example, I was shocked when my daughter, even at the age of three years old, started telling me that she wants blonde hair and blue 
eyes. And why? Because that's what she sees from the media, from the books, from the dolls which she plays with. And she thinks that she can only be pretty when she has those. And as a dad, I was honestly left rather heartbroken. And I reminded her time and time again that she is fearfully and wonderfully made. That she is beautiful just the way she is. And more importantly, that our inner beauty is way more important than our outer beauty. That's what counts. And then, not too young, long ago, uh, we have young people telling me that they don't feel deserving enough for their friends to celebrate their birthday with them because they think that they're not valuable enough. Imagine that. They think that they're undeserving even for people to wish them happy birthday. And then when I dig deeper to how they have come to such a conclusion, I find out that it all came from the lies of the enemy. All those, those thoughts from mass and social media, from their friends. The young people today, they are pegging their worth on temporal things in life, which many are honestly so trivial. And instead, they should be pegging their value on the truth, which is God's word. So church, can I tell you, teach our generations the truth. Empower them with the truth. If we don't start empowering our younger generations with the truth, we'll end up with a powerless church. That's it. No one or no one generation is free from the devil's lies. And one of the most common lies is that money is the end of all things. And it's all we need. And it's so easy to buy into that lie that money can solve all of our problems. And you know, even the disciples, they struggled with that too. When asked to feed the 5,000, the apostle Mark accounts to the disciples replying this. With what? We will have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all of these people. But look what Jesus can do with just two loaves, five loaves and two fish. Just five loaves and two fish. Once again, it doesn't matter how small or insignificant we think we are. It doesn't matter how little we have. If we put our faith in God and obey Him, He will empower us to empower others. You know, church, I'm so glad that in the end, the disciples, they got it. They got these principles. They understood that we don't need to have it all or be all in order to empower others. Instead, we just need to give it all to Jesus and let Him do the work. Let Him be the one who empowers. We are but the vessels. We are but the conduits of His power. And we see that in Acts, Acts chapter 3, when Peter and John were walking to the temple and a crippled man begged for money at the gate of Beautiful. Yeah, it's a famous account and I'm sure many of us know this. And I love what Peter said in Acts chapter 3, verse 6. And you know, I have to just recite this verse using the King James Version because it simply sounds so dramatic and I memorized this version. Acts chapter 3, verse 6, it says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Isn't that totally amazing? Peter and John understood that the power we have isn't gold or silver or the resources of this world. We have the name of Jesus. The name above all names. And when we use this name of Jesus, we can empower those around us. Church, say this together with me. 
And I know that we may not be able to hear each other, but God can hear you. When we claim this truth, we claim it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So all together, three, two, one, go. We have been empowered to empower lives. One more time. We have been empowered to empower lives. Amen. In the 19th century, there lived a Swedish businessman and inventor of the name Alfred Nobel. Alfred was a brilliant chemist and engineer and held 355 different patents. His most famous being his invention of dynamite. It is both more stable and more explosive than any other chemical known at that time. And that discovery of dynamite brought Alfred immediate wealth and recognition. One would say that this discovery made a huge impact in the world. After that discovery, everything in life seemed set for Alfred until something strange happened. An error in the newspapers got Alfred Nobel to re-evaluate his life. In 1888, Nobel's brother, Ludwig, died from in France from a heart attack and thanks to some poor reporting, at least one French newspaper believed that it was Alfred who had actually died. And it wrote this in his newspaper. It said, The merchant of death is dead. The merchant of death is dead. The ob ob obituary went on to describe Nobel as a man who became rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than before. Nobel was stunned by what he read and became determined to do something to improve his legacy. It led him to re-evaluate his career. You know, church, one year before he died in 1896, Nobel signed his last will and testament, which set aside the majority of his vast estate to establish the Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize to honour men and women for outstanding achievements in physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and for working toward peace. Today, the Nobel Prize seeks to empower men and women all around the world who push the boundaries of science and art for the betterment of from making a literal impact which aided in war and destruction to making a lasting impact by empowering others. That is the legacy of Alfred Nobel. And so church, my question today for all of us this morning, what do you want to be remembered for? What kind of impact do you want to leave behind? My brothers and sisters, may I suggest that with what we want to do is to make a godly impact wherever we are. And if we want to do that, then we need to encounter God, exemplify Christ, and empower lives. So church, who are you empowering today? Have you been empowered in the first place? And if you have been empowered, then what are you waiting for? For the conditions to be perfect? My friends, once again, God's perfect timing is not dictated by man's perfect uh, conditions. So instead of looking for our KPIs, let's start to step out of the boat just as we are. However little or insignificant we think that we are, and trust God that He will be bigger than what we could ever imagine and He will make our impact bigger than who we are. Before I end, I might invite all of us to stand. Let's stand and claim this truth together. 
let's stand, claim this truth by praising God with this song, even greater. So wherever you are right now, may I ask, let's lift up our hands. Let's raise our voices in your homes, in your rooms, all together now, church. And let's claim this truth together. Now is the time. Now is the time for God's people to arise. Yes, we are God's people and the day is here. The day is here. Lord, your kingdom we will be. We are called. We are called for greater. We are called for more. Let your power, let your love and power move through us. All we want, Lord. All we want is you, Lord, come and fill us. Hear the cry of our hearts, come and pour it. Let's declare it now. Pour it out on us. You alone are the one we desire, Jesus. You alone are the one. That we are living for So pour it out on us One more time Now is the time Now is the time For God's people to arise Calvary Assembly of God Let's arise the day is here, Lord, your kingdom we will build. We are called for greater, we are called for more. Let your love and power Move through us All together now All we want, Lord All we want is you, Lord Come and fill us Hear the cry of our hearts Come and pour it out Pour it out on us You alone are the one we desire Jesus, you alone. You alone are the one that we are living for. So pour it out on us. We believe for even greater. We believe for more. Speak it over your life right now. We believe for even greater. Let your power come upon us We believe for more One more time, we believe for even greater We believe for even greater We believe for more Lord, let your power Let your power fall upon us we believe for more All we want is you, Lord Come and fill us Hear the cry of our hearts Come and pour it out Pour it out on us You alone are the one we desire you alone are the one that we are living for. So pour it out on us. 
Father, I thank you for this message. I thank you, God, for every one of my brothers and sisters. And I pray that you would pour it out, your power, your love, your grace, your anointing into our lives, God, that we may be your vessels, that we may be your conduits of power, that it will flow through us, that love, that grace, that mercy, O oh Lord Jesus, and Holy Spirit, you flow through us into the rest of the world. Many will praise you. Many will come to know you. Many lives will be built through our work and through your name. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have given us the name of Jesus, the name above all names. I thank you, God, that you would partner together with us if right now I pray for any one of us who are struggling because maybe we still think that we are too insignificant, we are too small, we don't have enough. I pray for those who are still questioning, God, is this the right time? Lord Jesus, I pray for clarity, I pray for boldness, I pray for strength and courage to arise in them right now in the name of Jesus. Yes, God that you use us to be your messengers, that you use us to be your hands and feet of love. And many will know that you are our Lord and Saviour. In your most mighty name we pray. Amen.